better things to do with my money. Welcome to the Life and Times of Captain Barney Miller podcast. I'm your host, Mike. Joining me is, well, he used to be a plane's clothesman, and now he's been upgraded to detective. It is Mr. Chris Dashu. I feel personally attacked watching this episode. <laughs> These oh, three boy. episodes. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Wokesters, Wokesters, beware. Oh, You're boy. in for a scare. <laughs> I'm here, folks, and I'm ready to talk Barney Miller, season six. Season six starts off with Inquisition, which dropped September 13th, 1979. The Photographer, which came out September 20th, 1979. And Vacation, which came out September 27th, 1979. As we have noted in the past, this is a known Pitlick season. He is directing every single episode we're talking about this season. This episode, Inquisition, got a teleplay by Tony Sheehan. So, you know, we're in good hands. Story by Calvin Kelly and Jim Teasdale. There we go. That was taking me a little bit to say that. Inquisition. Are we going going Spanish here or what are we doing on this one, Chris? Nobody ever expects the Spanish Inquisition. We've said that twice in one week now. That's weird. (laughs) That's That's very weird. weird. Um, so this episode is all about one of the characters in the precinct being gay. (gasps) Whoa. Oh my. How salacious. However, it is a complete cop out, uh, in every stretch of the imagination. (laughs) Cause it's like, oh yeah, by the way, it's not just the dudes upstairs. It could be the people downstairs, too. And it's like and when they when they kind of put that part of it into perspective about halfway through the episode, you're like, oh, yeah, right. Like, would it there? Who would it be like? That was the thing I wanted to ask you, like if any of those characters in the precinct are gay of the main characters, it's got to be Dietrich, right? Oh, I was thinking Harris myself. Oh, okay. Like, oh, like bisexual, you mean? He's He's single. He's clean. He's neat. Yeah. I mean, B- Barney's into some freaky shit, apparently. <laughs> apparently so, <laughs> What yeah. is Barney into? Like, <laughs> is uh, what is Barney into? Is that, it? what is the implication, as they would say? Yeah. Is he into pee and poo? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, man. What is Barney into where he's like, I don't think it's weird, but you would, like. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe he's calling Barbara Berry mommy or something. I don't know. Oh, what if he what if he tops from the bottom type thing? Oh, you yeah. don't want to be around people like that. <laughs> I, that's fair. But I mean, Barney's just like, uh, hey, Liz, peg me. <laughs> <laughs> what he's doing is, you know, Chano's still in our life. He comes over and fucks my wife and I watch. Oh, oh, it would Maybe probably that's be- what happened to Mike. <laughs> oh, that's how he knows Mike so well. <laughs> God, good lord. Oh man, yeah, this is an interesting episode. I think the subject matter is fine. I, I think oh, it's yeah. handled better than most of these episodes have handled it. But uh it's kind of a strange conceit. This is 1979. We right. are pre-AIDS crisis. We're 10 years after Stonewall. We've had gay characters on here before, all the way back in season one, but not one of our own. But I agree with you as far as Officer Zatelli, though he has been a frequent guest and has been part of the upstairs occasionally, especially when Levitt got bumped up, as he does occasionally. And we'll definitely talk about that as we go on in this episode. But yeah, he's not one of the core people. So I can see where you're coming from. I just think it's still pretty brave in 1979 to have this character that they're not making fun of. He's not some sort of lisping queen. He's not, you know, talking about the color of the drapes or anything. Seems like a regular, degular dude who happens to be gay. And I'm like, all right, that's pretty good for 1979. No, that in in that regard, I completely agree. I mean, in terms of like the narrative, it's it's a little bit of a cop out. But outside of oh, the yeah. kind of the narrative cop out, I think the episode's perfectly fine. It, this show has never really had a hard time portraying homosexual characters in a positive way. That's not degrading. Mind you, Wojohowicz is still Wojohowicz, yeah. sort of, but then not I really. Know. Yeah. It, More it's, than anything, I think he's mad about Scanlan being there. Right. It's the whole, you know, we don't care that you're gay thing. Right. It's like, 
Okay. Well, we it's not the it's the, the Ted Lasso did the whole fucking thing better than I could. Where we care, but oh, we don't care. Jesus Christ. Yes. <laughs> Right. Like yeah, that's I would ask Chris, maybe you drop a little bit of that in here because that was one of the best speeches from Ted Lasso. And that whole show has just been golden. But that when he was talking about that, what Denver Broncos fan and the seven layer dip, holy shit, that was fucking brilliant. And yeah, we don't get that moment here, but we do get as close as we can for this time period. And we should also say, like, this is the time of like Billy Crystal playing a gay character on soap. I think it's right around this time, but there's not a lot of positive gay images on TV for anybody to look at. And I think the other issue I do have is by not making one of the main characters gay, it kind of doesn't matter that Zatelli is gay. And that's again, I mean, they're kind of having their cake and eating it too, as it were. Like I, again, like you said, 79, I get it representation isn't what it is then versus now. And that's fine. And again, I, you know, I was joking about being personally attacked. There's nothing offensive about this episode outside of the things that are intended to be bristly, AKA fucking Scanlon. Again, just jo- George Murdoch is just, it's just the worst. Like he's the worst. He is the worst. And that comes through in this episode. I'm actually kind of surprised that they didn't just take the opportunity to out Luger here because I'm pretty sure Luger's <laughs> gay. Okay. I'm just saying all of a sudden he's putting his marriage on the on the on the back burner for a second because he just realized that maybe he's not as much into women as he initially thought. Like, there you go. And James Gregory could have James Gregory could have made that work. And I don't think it's that much of a stretch, really. No. And here we are talking about these first three episodes. No Luger yet so i'm anxiously now talk about a difference from however many years ago when we started talking about this what a difference that i'm now looking forward to seeing luger and i'm just like please come on back let's see you right and i i he would have been a welcome presence in this episode um outside of the gay thing though like I think the episode's fine, but the gay thing takes up most of the episode, thankfully. Like, it is the focus, at least. Yeah, yeah. Well, and one thing I want to focus on real quick as a little detour, season six, we got a new opener. We are going totally away. Like, we've got the opening of New York City, but we don't have Barney walking down the street anymore. We've got him walking through the bullpen. Doesn't really match up to the music too well. Like, it used to be, like, the cuts and the, you know, like... Some of the beats in the music dictated where the cuts were. There's a little bit of a flourish when Max Gale looks down at his baseball and kind of notices something. But I have to say, and I bet you any dollars that you picked up on this too, Landisburg. What the hell's going on with Landisburg in these opening credits? Last season, when we're talking about Steve Landisburg, it's like, oh, it looked like an outtake. It looked like Danny Arnold was just like feeding them lines or something. And he's just laughing. And it's basically the same thing. It's like we we are following Barney through the bullpen as he's making his way to the office. We kind of jump back to Harris and then almost like where Harris is sitting. Apparently, I guess he's right in front of him would be Dietrich. And he's just laughing at the camera, breaking the fourth wall, kind of walking a little bit, laughing some more. And then we cut to, to poor Levitt and he's there in front of the, the sign in board. And he's not doing all the mugging that he was last season, but I'm just like, what? no, you, you start, you start at the door. Here's how Landon, you move in. Maybe Wojo's there. Introduce Max Gale. He turns, he sees Ron Harris. Now we got his credit. He comes across, there's Dietrich. And then maybe you got Levitt making coffee or something like introduce the team in order as you go through the office. But I don't know, maybe maybe I'm thinking way too much about this. Levitt ends up looking more like a plumber than he does a cop (laughs) because he's standing in front of that fountain. And it looks like he's working on the fountain as opposed to on the board. It's like, is this guy the plumber? It's me, (laughs) Levitt. I mean, it works. Small, diminutive, Italian. All he (laughs) needs is a mustache. Uh, it's interesting, though, you mentioned the Landisburg thing. It's like, I don't know what they were thinking. He's like, he's like focusing on someone who's off stage. Yeah. It's yeah. bizarre. And That's he's just like I, laughing, I, like, hey, 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 yeah. like, 
It's almost like they took the thing from last season and they just said, okay, remember how we, you were laughing before we're going to do that same thing this year, but we're going to do it in a different place. And it's going to look like you're actually part of the set, but it still just doesn't integrate. And they were doing weird camera angles that they don't do during the show either. Oh yeah. And the intro, like if you watch the intro and then you watch the show, you'd be like, these are two different things like this this feels very the intro doesn't feel like the show anymore the way it did up until this point yeah and at least the music i think the music has gone back to normal and we don't go up one more octave like we were doing last season where it's just like whoa this is a little harsh here right no i think you're right the the music the music works better but it doesn't sync up with what's going on 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 screen as well as it used to Yeah. yeah Yeah. So the whole gay thing, that's definitely our A story. The whole thing with Scanlon coming in. I did notice, you know, I was around when the term sexual preference changed to sexual orientation. So it was interesting for me to hear them talk about sexual preference because it's like it used to be, and I'm sure you're well aware of this, but just for the audience, we used to say the term sexual preference as if oh, I just prefer men to women or I prefer women to men rather than it's not really a choice. It is your orientation. So I did notice that they had that. Um, but the the B story, I really enjoyed because we're back to that whole thing. What is it that Otto and, and Danny Ardell call it? Like a, a nut with proof? Oh, paranoids with proof. Yeah. Paranoids with proof because we've got this guy who comes in who is all about the in the elevators. <laughs> Was your version of this censored as well? No, I watched it on on the Plex server, so it uh, wasn't censored. I guess the Amazon one is censored. The one that I watched, and I don't know, I didn't watch the Amazon one. I thought I watched it off of your server. It might have been off of my server. So whoever uploaded that, it was the censored version where Muzak is not bleeped out. It's just eliminated from the soundtrack. Interesting. Yeah, it was really, really weird because they're just talking and then all of a sudden the audio just drops. And I'm like, wait, wait a second. That was very strange. And then there's one point, might be Dietrich, he makes a, a reference about the music man, like the the music man, the musical, but they cut the, the music word. So he's just like, he's the man and i'm like what <laughs> <laughs> oh my god i kind of wish i had watched it now <laughs> so strange and then yeah i love the whole thing of how mr muzak comes in and they're like oh hey you know you're uh this guy says that he's got proof that you have subliminal uh messages in your your muzak there and he's like oh can i make a phone call <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't supposed to get out. They weren't right? supposed to know that. <laughs> I or no, he's it. like, they're not supposed to be reporting on that, I think is exactly what he says. Like, right. Uh, Norman so Bartold, good. I've only seen him in Close Encounters, uh, but he's got a great voice. Oh, he does. Put yeah. your ass right to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> well, and Peter Jur- Jurassic is the guy who's accusing him of all this. He has a great look. He kind of reminded me a little of... Um, I know he's been obviously in a, a ton of stuff, especially Babylon 5 and Tron, but he reminded me a little bit of like a Josh. Um, oh, God, what's that guy's name that played um, Herod in uh, the the um, Jesus Christ Superstar? Jo- uh, Zero, no, Josh Mostel. Zero mm, Mostel's Zero son. Mostel's son. Yeah. Yeah. I can, yeah, I can kind of see that. It could have been the hair. I think the hair might have done it's it. It's the hair. It's the hair. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> also, what a great last name, Jurassic. Just want to point that out. That's, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's a great last name. He's he's fun in this episode. I mean, again, like I will say, like the B plot with the you know paranoid with proof, like they do that a lot. Oh yeah. Like maybe to kind of you could say it's kind of getting near to a fault. Like I, I like it, but it is kind of samey. Like yeah. right, it is. Well, like it's this kind samey. of the show's formula at this point. Yeah. But a lot of times these paranoids of proof, it doesn't feel as socially, well, Muzak is not socially relevant, but the whole (laughs) idea of us being subjected to this ever-present, syrupy, saccharine, awful music, and especially that it is 
containing subliminal messages, right? You know, that's a really good thing to bring up. And I feel like these paranoids with proof is almost the social consciousness. Also, you know, you've got the social sure. consciousness of Zatelli being gay, but then you have that stuff. But I feel the wor- the the most useless part of this episode is David Darlow as this burglar who attacks adult bookstores. He seems to have no anything to him. He just feels like his index card. You know, I was talking about the index card of ideas. It feels like his index card had one line, and that was it. I honestly kind of forgot that that was even in this episode. Like it's right? so it's so unmemorable. Well, when Jurassic goes into the cage, I'm like, oh yeah, there's that other guy in the cage because he gets introduced in the pre-credit sequence, and then he's barely there for the rest of the episode. And he's just and comparatively to in the next two episodes, we'll see people getting into it in the lockup. Like in oh, this yeah. one, it's like, why is this one guy even here? Like he doesn't do enough to justify being there. No. No, they could have used actually more Zatelli, I think, in this episode and had a little bit more of him. Like, I love the whole idea of him kind of flirting with the idea of coming out, but he can't really do it publicly, but he's doing it for Barney. It's like he seems to know Barney is a judgment free zone and he's able to talk with him, which is interesting because it's he's not one of Barney's guys. You know, he's a uniform. He he works downstairs, but. Which is why him being gay is the biggest cop out. Yeah, yeah, Why is exactly. he even telling Barney? Like, right. why would Barney care? Yeah, exactly. I just Other don't than get it. This like, guy wants some sort of outlet. So, And I'm sure as this season goes on, we're going to get a lot more of the telly having one-on-ones with Barney. I would hope so. If that ends up being the case, then great. If this is that opening moment, awesome. It's just, I didn't, wouldn't necessarily expect that given, again, this show doesn't necessarily care too much about continuity. Well, I feel like as we've gone along, we've gotten more continuity to the point where in the next episode, Dietrich is there. It's either the next episode or the one after that, talking about how it's his third anniversary. And I'm just like, oh, okay. Yeah. We that was at really... the beginning of this episode. Was it this one? That okay. was how the season opened. Yeah. Where I... he's like, it's been three. It's essentially like, it's been three years since I joined the show. Like, I didn't get you a gift. Yeah. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> Ron Harris is so fucking funny. He just puts up with his shit. That's it. It's easier to put up with his shit than to fight it. Like that's oh, what God, it is. Yeah. Like, you know, God. Oh well, my. And then on in the next episode, he really just Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> I did like to the whole thing of Levitt having I guess it was Levitt that kind of talks the telly into Talking with Barney, um, you know, oh, he is a really good guy. He's a little too picky, though. And then I love how Barney says that at the very end. He's like, oh, I'm not too picky. And then the look on Levitt's face. <laughs> I mean, again, Barney said he was into some weird stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, hey, maybe Barney gives mustache rides to not just women. <laughs> and I did like that moment, too, at the end when Scanlon is almost trying to connect with barney this whole thing like oh yeah we've had our differences and he's got this like grudging respect for barney and barney's just like yeah no that's a one-way street (laughs) and and it and that's the thing like it totally is like scanlan is i feel like the de facto villain of this show oh yeah the the antagonist of i mean of all of them is his mm-hmm. Scanlon, you know, the whole thing of like, oh, I'll put the bribe money away. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, again, like when when the expectation is you have to have something like that, George Murdoch is a perfect, oh, a yeah. perfect person for this role because he is just very unsavory kind of across the board. Yeah. Yeah, he is. I mean, he's such a great actor and he plays this type of role in so many things because he does it like a champ. Yeah. Again, you know, say what you will about typecasting, but some actors just play bastards better than others. And George Murdoch plays a pretty good bastard in the face of like essentially people just laughing at him constantly. Yeah. I'm trying to remember, I was looking up something with him in it and it was like him and Harris Eulin and a couple other guys. And I'm just like, these are, these are like the heavy hitters when it comes to character villains. And yeah. I now need to go back and take a look because those two together, I don't know if they share the, uh, the screen at the same time, but they're very cut from the same cloth a lot of times. So I'm just like, Hmm, this could be interesting. What about Dabney Coleman? Oh boy. Dabney Coleman. 
I was just watching, uh, they were having a, a, a Columbo marathon over the weekend and it was his episode, which we'll get to in like seven or eight years, the way that we're going. <laughs> nice. Stuff. I'm excited. <laughs> but he he's Danny Coleman to me is like this forgotten treasure. And he was so good in so many movies. I mean, I grew up watching nine to five, so he was just, and he was an ever present person. I mean, he had Buffalo bill, all this kind of stuff. And just not enough people talk about Dabney Coleman these days. So thank you, Chris. You're welcome. I am a huge fan of Dabney Coleman. He's just, he for me is one of those like perfect dickhead villain actors the same way chris mcdonald is like chris mcdonald chris mcdonald is a great character actor villain but i I would say dabney coleman and chris mcdonald are better in like comedic things you know like like heavily comedic because you know i think of dabney coleman i think of dragnet and hot to trot which is oh boy the fucking worst and chevy chase has modern problems where he has like fake teeth in his mouth the entire movie yeah i love i'm i am a dabney coleman fan as well but i love the i love 80s and 90s and 70s like character actor villain character actors because there's there's like 20 of them i think that are the the ones that everybody talks about and they pop up all the time you know what chris i think we just found a replacement for ranking on bass when we wrap up the dabney cast (laughs) the the coleman cast not ron not uh not not gary coleman though i mean who else around here is named dabney there's no other dabney that i can think of that's fair dabney cast yeah Hmm. yeah we just keep doing podcasts on dead people though i don't know where you're (laughs) I thought he was alive. <laughs> I thought Dabney Coleman is dead. Oh, I God. think he's alive. Oh, right, God. I'm to the internet. Oh, no. No, he's still around, buddy. Oh, shit. Okay. Yeah. Well, I apologize to Dabney Coleman, who's 91 years old. He's looking pretty rough now. Yeah. He was in uh, 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 Boardwalk Empire. That was the last yep. thing I saw him in. And he's also in Yellowstone. So, yeah, he's still working. Good for I him. I love it. Damn. Fuck. Oh, man. I can't wait till we get to the pound puppies where he was the mayor for four episodes. Oh, dear God. The Dabney, the Dabney Coleman cast. Oh, the this Dabney cast. Be, yeah. <laughs> the niche of niche. When we talk for- with Richard in a half an hour here, I, I, I'm going to pitch it. I'm going to pitch it. <laughs> He he'd probably do it just, just to be like, as long as it's not ranking on bad. <laughs> just for spite. Yeah. All right. Oh man. So yeah, to wrap this one up, I'm looking forward to what they do as the telly. We don't get a lot of him, if any, in the next Are they going to do something with him though? Like, oh, is that yeah, for sure? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I I mean, I remember from, okay. um, from talking with Otto in the past where he's just like, oh yeah, he's one of the, you know, he's a gay character and he's not used all the time. So I'm like, okay, but yeah, okay. I haven't looked up, um, what uh dino uh what other episodes he's in dino natali but i know he's in a uh, quite a few more episodes okay cool because like i just want to make sure because like it's like oh he's gay and then like goodbye <laughs> like, right. goodbye from the show like okay fuck what like they we, mic'd his ass real hard well if we play our cards right too he is um he's going to he's still alive we might be able to actually talk with him that'd be kind of cool yeah hell yeah that would be great yeah. uh so he's in two one more episode in season 15 so i'm sorry only one more and then he's in only one in season seven so just two more times so i was misled i thought he was going to be in here a lot more that is a shame. Yeah, yeah. Gay representation. This is not, but that's okay. It's 1979, folks. You gotta, you gotta give them, you can't get mad about things that have already happened. We just need to do better. And we are. Hey, exactly. We are. So in the next episode, we are talking about the photographer. And this one, I think, has the best running bits. Uh, of these three episodes, especially this whole thing, the opening with Dietrich and Barney talking about salt, the seasoning or the treaty. Um, and just Dietrich taking over the conversation, talking down to Barney, and then Barney just coming back with the, are you familiar with the term pedantic? <laughs> and then I like and that I, Dietrich gets to turn it back around on him. Oh, it's so good. And I was waiting though for Dietrich to take that and then be like, how about the Mets? <laughs> <laughs> I like that. He's like, oh, what are you oh pedantic, huh? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Especially because I I'm so 
jumping ahead a little bit. And a Tiger, he's back. And he is talking, he is Christ now. I love that he plays. And actually, I, I'm sorry, I think it's pronounced Tiger. So Kenneth Tiger is back. Now he is Jesus Christ. And I have to say, I never heard the term Perusia before. So thank you, Dietrich, for introducing me to that. I uh, I like that Kenneth Tiger is playing like the ultimate version of all the characters he's played up until this point. So good. Yeah, it he's so good. He's fantastic in this show. I mean, every Ugh. time he's shown up, he has stolen the spotlight every time. The werewolf, it, the go- was it the werewolf, the ghost, and now this is his third time as Jesus Christ, right? Yeah, at least. I'm not sure if he's done any more, but yeah, he's amazing. And this whole episode is just filled with familiar faces because Sal Vicuso has been on here before. I love him coming in and and being like the the first criminal that they lock up. Um, and and then fucking um, what's his name, Phil? Uh, Phil Leeds. The, Yes. Oh my God. And especially the build up for that joke, the build up with uh, the lady was just like, oh, he was so handsome. <laughs> and I'm like, wait, I'm like, who are they going to bring into the station house? This is amazing. And then Phil Lead shows up and I'm like, oh my God, this is hilarious. <laughs> I just said she is so jealous of him and let, he was taking pictures of other women and you know oh, the the way that Barney gets her to sign the complaint is that he'll be she'll be able to see him more at the trial and all this. It was so very, good. It's very bizarre. I mean, I feel like haven't we had a similar we had a similar thing to this last season where there was a guy harassing women? Oh yeah, yeah. There was the guy who was touching feet, and I That's think that was, was um was that was that the lady from Ice Pirates or was that uh Alex Elias? It might have been Alex Elias, the uh, uh, hot coffee from um uh uh Citizens Band. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, I, you're right. I think you're right, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, I but yeah, and then we've had people, we've had women looking through mug books before. There was the one woman who just came to New York and she's like well, it's better than seeing Annie. So right, yeah, that and that was like right at the end of the last season. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I like where this one ends up going with the Phil Lead stuff. I think the Kenneth Tiger stuff is better. I think it's yeah. more interesting. Again, I don't, I don't know what the show is getting at. I mean, the show has played a lot with these kind of weird metaphysical things that, like, mm-hmm. I'm not sure I understand. Like well, this whole thing. So Salvacuso as Joseph Beatty's brought in. He's got tons of drugs on him and he meets Kenneth Tiger in the cage. And it's just like, Oh, what are those guys called? The apostles. And he wants to become one of uh, Tiger's new apostles. And uh, he's like, Oh, can you work a miracle for me? And then next thing you know, Oh, all those drugs were fake. (laughs) They're all baking soda. And he's like, looks at him like, Oh my God. And that look at Tiger's face. (laughs) I mean, that's the thing. Tiger plays it with such like sincerity. He just oh, plays God, it yes. so straight. He just lo- he just looks at everybody with that that dopey smile and just yeah. Like again, I don't understand if there's a point to any of this with these kinds of things, but I en- enjoy and appreciate that they're part of this show. Mm-hmm. That there's these weird kind of like the alien thing and the werewolf thing and the ghost thing. Like I and the fact like the fact that Dietrich is an alien has been yeah. more or less confirmed by the people who make this show. Like that's that was never part of Spin City, guys. Like right. you know, Columbo right. never turned out to be a chud or something. Like there's there's <laughs> none. I mean, that would be interesting if it was just the really shabby detective. Uh, but there's none of that in any of these other I'm shows. From the sewers. Yeah. <laughs> but there's none <laughs> of that. He in- attacked John Hurd and <laughs> Dan- Daniel Stern. <laughs> <laughs> right. There's none of that in this. Oh. Like, and there's none of that in, or and not in this, but there's none of that in like Hill Street Blues and stuff like that, like other cop shows. So it's weird, but I appreciate it. It almost makes it feel like, in a way, a precursor to Night Court. Oh, uh-huh. right. I can definitely see that. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, Night Court would be a good follow-up to this. Right. I've never seen Night Court, but I know that Night Court has like 
weird things that happen mm-hmm. that are just weird. Like they do they interact with like monsters and shit in that show, right? Like well, people that think they're monsters, I'm assuming, similar Richard to this. Maul kind of was a monster, but <laughs> <laughs> John Larroquette. <laughs> yeah, I had a real hard time with with uh Night Court when it was originally aired because I just I was like, why is he so mean all the time? Dan, the John Larroquette character and I don't know. Every once in a while, like you never knew where you stood with Harry. Harry definitely has a lot of Barney Miller vibes. So I can totally see where you're coming from. And yeah, all the all the weirdos that come in and that we barely ever leave the courtroom. So yeah, you're right on track, man. That that's great. And I want to say that if you take the opening of Night Court and you play the Barney Miller theme over it, that it actually fits really well. Really? I want to say a friend of mine sent me that. Yeah. This uh, this reminds me. Is this like some sort of Wizard of Oz, Pink Floyd thing? If you play, it, the might, theme be, of it might be. <laughs> yeah, but you don't have to like. It doesn't like stop. You know, two thirds the way through, and then you have to put on animals or something, and then it, yeah, <laughs> and pretend it and just pretend that this right. all makes yeah. sense. It all makes sense. Yeah, of <laughs> course. Roger Waters was watching this and recording all at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Just like Kenneth Tiger is Jesus. Yes, yes. But he's billed as Jesus Christ in this episode, so he must be Jesus Christ. Poor Wojo is so confused. And and here we actually have the first confirmation that Barney is Jewish. Like, yeah. full-fledged confirmation. Right. Which And they just, they just say it so flippantly. It's like, oh, that's right, I forgot you're Jewish. It's like, what? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> By the way, and then Bojo yeah. goes, and oh yeah, I'm not a very good Catholic either. It's like, and you're Catholic? Like, wait a second here. Right. He's never mentioned that, has he? Well, that makes sense. He's Polish. They're almost all Catholic. That's fair, but, but also don't want to uh, assume. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I don't know which way right. that pole's sausage hangs. I don't know. Maybe it hangs <laughs> on the right. Maybe it hangs on the right. I don't know. I do yeah, appreciate yeah. how flippant they were. Which like, you're Jewish. Yeah. As if we knew that. Like, right, right, I don't yeah. want to assume just because the actor is Jewish, but you know, like, and also his name is Miller, but like, I don't yeah. want to assume, but like, okay, season six coming in hot. Like, Jesus, Jesus. I, I am sure that there are people named Miller that aren't Jewish, though. Yeah. Oh, I, I, I just assume that's why they named him that. Yeah. It's like, honestly, I, Wojohowicz is a much more like, again, like you would assume, like, Mm-hmm. Maybe he's the Jewish character. I don't know what it. What does it matter at this point? I guess like it's such a. It it's kind of a weird thing to bring up. Like, but you're Jewish. Like, yeah, we've made it this far in Barney Miller without it mattering, guys. Like, why do we have yeah, to confirm I mean, I, that? Like, I guess Jesus just pushes the issue because it's like, oh, fair. I, I do like that whole thing of who was it that goes and washes their hand and. Hands and of course, and I think it's Dietrich that says, "Of course, there is a precedent for that." Oh, it's a it's a Wojohowicz. <laughs> I'm gonna go wash my hands. Again. Of course you would. I think it's something that affects. It's like, That's great. Yeah, I, I again, I like what Kenneth Tiger brings to the episode. I think that that like having that kind of situation with all of them to deal with it is interesting. I I think the Phil Lead stuff is okay. Yeah, I don't think it's as interesting. I don't think it's as interesting as. The Kenneth Tiger stuff, but they don't spend very much time with Phil Leeds comparatively. Yeah. Yeah. I kind of wish that there was a little bit more to his character and like a reason, you know, like that he's doing this or something. Right. Something. Like just uh, a little bit more. Like why? Yeah. Like, we, like if you're going to do one of these characters again, you've got to give us more than you've given us before. And like you mentioned in the past, it's pretty much been not much. Like they're not expounding on why these characters are doing why they're doing. Maybe this episode they should have. Like maybe that would have helped with that i mean look phil leeds is a great character actor and he's got a great look so he can he can shoulder the responsibility of being given something interesting to say mm-hmm. but they just kind of don't they're not interested in that it's 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 a, it's a little bit of a missed opportunity really yeah and in the final episode that we're talking about tonight which is a vacation this one um yeah, th- th- this one, we've got a central conceit of Barney hanging up a vacation calendar. It's not the most motivating thing in the world, but there are some interesting stuff going on here. The whole idea of Harris going on a ski trip, uh, as opposed to Dietrich needing those that exact same time off to go to a Goethe festival. And there's a lot of Goethe expected, necessarily. <laughs> Our internet is Uh-oh. is am off. I lagging? Yeah. Oh boy. I was trying to see when. Okay. I thought are we good? 
I think so. Okay. All is right. it weird that Barney Miller is making jokes about Goethe? It feels very on brand for Dietrich, at least. For, on, for Dietrich, yes. But you know what I mean. Like, what yeah. kind of cop show? Again, I go back to this. What kind of cop show is making these kinds of jokes? And, like, only Barney Miller is. is oh, right. yeah. Yeah. Like, the whole policis interruptus. Uh, 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 it's Latin humor. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I feel like, you know, at this point where it's season six, so I don't necessarily remember a lot of the early seasons of the show, but I don't remember the comedy being so esoteric in those first three seasons before Dietrich showed up. And now it's gotten very esoteric and like right, intentionally right. strange comparatively. Yeah, it, well, it, yeah. And I'm here for that. Definitely. This is the kind of weird shit that really tickles my funny bone when you mentioned ted lasso before and just like that quick banter and the weirdness of like coach beard and stuff this just plays right into that for me just having this strange dude so landisberg reminds me a lot of stephen wright oh yeah Right. I think I've said that before on the show, but like Landisberg's comedy stylings have lived on and I appreciate that. And it's it's a welcome in, injection into a show that was rather normal. I mean, Danny Arnold brings a lot to this show with the Paranoids with Proof stuff that, like I said, other shows like this didn't have. But I mean, outside of those, you have to have some other things to really keep the train moving. And Steve Landisberg being added to this uh show i think is the smartest thing they ever did honest to god like the smartest choice was adding steve landisberg as a reoccurring character and then a main oh, cast yeah. member like he he has absolutely like he is a he is a treasure and a gem like i haven't seen him in anything else other than like the, the in fucking forgetting sarah marshall where it's like, oh, it's totally Steve yeah. Landisberg as the as Jason Siegel's doctor. And I think we talked about that last time. Like Landisberg, like I don't I I, I want to go see other things that he's in, but like, why would I when we're just watching the thing that he was in the most more than anything else? Best I can tell. Like, this was his like big role, right? I think so, yeah. And like that's it. And right. you know what? Like, he probably lived a amazing life off of this show. For the rest of his life, because he was in 124 episodes of this. And that it's still on, guys. Like it's still in syndication. Like that's the thing. Like, but Landisberg for me is the best part of this show in yeah. so many ways. And his addition to the show has made the show's shelf life for me seemingly almost endless. Like I'm on board to the end of this show. And if the person that they added in Abe Vagoda's place hadn't been such a strong presence, I don't think I would be as into the show because mm -hmm. so much of what makes me laugh and what I enjoy about the show is the weird energy that Steve Landisberg brings to it. I mean, it's like, I'm trying to think of like post Barney, you know, like Harris, I think Ron Glass might be the most successful Barney Miller castmate insofar as, you know, his recurring role on like uh, Firefly. Um, he had at least a few other shows. I want to say he did a lot of producing work as well. Is in Twilight Zone? He was definitely in Twilight Zone, which is hilarious because there's that Faust joke um you know i sold my soul to go on this vacation and i was just like oh that's pretty funny you know, i thought about of that as that well i have newton episode yeah yep, yep. and i was like it you know in a couple of but, years you'll be on the other side of this bargain <laughs> but yeah it's like i i i am unfamiliar with a lot of landis burke's other work apparently he was in one called head case from 2007 to 2009 he was in 28 episodes but I don't even know that one. So yeah, it's I, I might like you, I'm tempted to track down some of these other things, even if it's just watching Ladybugs with um the one and only Rodney Dangerfield in it. Oh, somebody step on a duck. <laughs> and some Rodney Dangerfield. Those two on screen together would be kind of insane. Speaking of Dabney Coleman, he was also uh in one episode of the nine to five TV show, which oh my um, God. didn't really even know that that was a thing, guys. So it sure is. And yeah. it's not good. Yeah. Sally I've Struthers, Valerie Curtin, and Rachel Patton jo Parton George. So I love that there was a Parton uh in this oh, as yeah. well. 
playing yeah. Dolly Parton's character. I had to watch some of it for uh, 80s TV ladies because they're covering it on their show. Wow. It's not good. <laughs> wow. Shocking, I know. I'm amazed they could even find a copy of on it. On YouTube. We didn't find copies. It's like oh, it's okay. like fish. It's that same, like, it's and you know what? Like, I, I don't think people who watch Barney Miller don't understand this, but I think a lot of other people don't. Like, there's so much shit that's just lost that oh, so yeah. many people spent so much time making and like, and it's not like, you know, the whatever that Jerry Lee Lewis weird clown movie is. It's not like that where it's like hidden away or whatever. G- Jerry Lewis, not Jerry Lee Lewis. <laughs> <laughs> Jerry Lewis, whatever. Jerry Lewis. I didn't know that those were two different people. Oh, oh yeah. no, right. Yeah, yeah, Jerry Lee Lewis. But they're both problematic in their own special ways, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. But it's we not like only that. Got one more year. That's fair. Uh, it's like, it's not like that. It's like, you know, fish is like impossible to find like the yeah. second and third oh, yeah. season of it. And like that nine second. to five TV no. show, like a lot of stuff is gone. So, you know, Barney Miller, thankfully not part of that group. I mean, it has shout factory and one of the more popular TV shows yeah. of all time, but there's so much stuff that's just gone. Well, the very first movie that Landisberg was ever in, you've got to walk it like you talk it or else you'll lose that beat is a lost movie from 1971. So his whole, you know, his, his uh, first role is gone. Interesting. That's insane. That's maybe one of these days we'll be able to find it. But yeah. so far, nope, it is on the lost media wiki. And those guys do a really good job of trying to track stuff down as well. So and that's one movie that I think has been on my want list for probably over 12 years now. Interesting. That's insane. Yeah. So with this one, we've got... We've got our our A story, I would say, is the vacation stuff. The C story is the stuff with Jack Bernardi as Mr. Gilman. He is making, uh, you can't say fake phone calls. He's making these phone calls, making fake, fake claims that there are crimes going on, and he is then monitoring the response of the police, emergency services, call fire it strength men. testing, Mike. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> strength testing the system. <laughs> In the most yeah, illegal yeah. way possible. Yes, yes. I mean, I think it's kind of necessary, but yeah, I, I kind of agree also- with you. I actually kind of agree. Like, I don't under like I understand why they think what he's doing is bad and why it's like not great, but also like someone should be doing that. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And it's Jack Bernard is great. He's got such a great face. Like, he's got a face that's good enough that I was like. Has this guy been in The Godfather? I mean, he seems like he should be around the table with the heads of the five families. Yeah, I I agree. He's he's a. I mean, again, it's it's also like you could say the same thing about Bruno Kirby, right? Or oh, Bruce, God. Bruce, I guess Bruce Kirby, not Bruno Bruce Kirby, Kirby, his yeah. son. Yeah, Bruno Kirby shows up in this same thing, and it's like just like again, like you see him and you immediately know, like oh there, yeah, there you go, like you know who that guy is. Period. It's that same thing. I'm like, he he needs to be around a bunch of other Italians. Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah, it is so funny because uh his brother, Bruce Bruce Kirby, is playing the one of the Rossman brothers. His brother is played by Ben Slack. And it's so funny if you bring up Ben Slack's IMDB profile, there's a picture from Night Court. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Yep, yep. Him and Larry Gelman, another very familiar face. So yeah, it's pretty good. He's great. I love his awful comb over that he's got in this. It's terrific. I also like that he's trying to get a kidney from Wojohowitz. He's like, hey, it, yeah, all yeah, he's brothers talking under about- Christ. Yes. <laughs> Give so me your good. kidney, motherfucker. What hap- What happens if my last kidney gives up? You have a brother too, don't you? <laughs> yeah. It's like, Jesus, go away. I love Kirby, though. He's just like, I could have three kidneys and I wouldn't give you one. <laughs> but even at the end, he's like, okay, fine. I'll give you a kidney. I'm going to ask. But he might pull a Homer Simpson and just leave him hanging there at the end. Oh, yeah. I, I would be fine with that because his brother's a real piece of shit. Yeah. He's he's not characterized in a way where there's any amount of empathy that I feel for him. He's just like, yeah, yeah. Like, I understand why your brother's like, I don't want to do anything for you, bro. Especially not give you part of my body. <laughs> right, right. And then we end with an N-word joke in this episode. I can't believe that we go there. And I don't know how many people in 2023 are going to realize that they 
did that, but that's pretty fucking funny to me that when they're trying to work out their schedule, going back to that vacation schedule, they go, well, we could do eeny, meeny, eeny, meeny, miny, mo," And then Harris is just like, hey, let's just do one potato, two potato, huh? <laughs> <laughs> uh-huh. I was going to ask you about that as well as to whether or not that joke plays anymore. I laughed really hard. Okay. No, like the funniness aside, like, I, do you think someone who watched in 2023 oh, would get what they mean? I don't like, know if they would. Because like if I they think would that... get Harris's reaction to what they're saying. Because right, like, right. I know, but I also yeah. know what the original title of Agatha Christie's and then there were none. Was. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, when I was a kid, it was always oh, catch a tiger, can a tiger by the toe. But yeah, now it's like, you know, yeah, to your point. How many people know what I'm those original sure. words were? I'm not even sure people would know the catch a tiger by its toe thing. Like, I don't true, know. True, true. I don't think, yeah, I think that that's like the eeny, meeny, miny, mo thing is interesting because people do still say eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Right, right. But they don't seem to realize that if there's two things that whatever you start with will be the opposite for the ending. So if you want to win eeny, meeny, miny, mo, you just point at the person, you go eeny, and then off you go, man. It always <laughs> sounds odd. I'm Mo. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I like I like the joke. I thought it was funny. I wasn't offended. I was more just yeah asking like, would someone in 2023 know? And I just don't think they would. I I think you're probably right. Yeah, which is a I, shame because it is a funny and it's a totally earned joke. Oh, <laughs> like, God, it's a fucking yeah. funny joke. Like it's funny and it's totally earned. And I think this whole thing with him going skiing is going to come back again later on. So. I hope so. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, and I do like the surprise of people like, oh, you're skiing and, and just like, you know, because it doesn't seem like a urban professional black man would be big into skiing in Wyoming, but more power to you, man. That's pretty great. And I love how just pedestrian Barney is where he's just like, oh, oh, okay. Yeah. It's like oh, that, how, how, how fresh and interesting that is. And it feels like Barney's, of course, he's probably never hit the slopes. Well, That's even, fine. He's like, hey, Jackson, Alabama, right, Wyoming, right, yeah. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> which cracks me up more because to think about Harris out in Jackson, Wyoming skiing is just like the funniest fucking thing to think about. Like, <laughs> I thought it was Mississippi. Oh, no, I guess it's Jackson, Mississippi. Wait, it's right. Jack, Jack, there's Jackson all over, isn't there? Yeah, yeah. Probably. But yeah, I'm sure he's just like, what are you talking about, Barney? I'm not going to go to Mississippi. <laughs> wow. I was like, is that, race? <laughs> is that a racist thing? Barney, are you? I almost think it might be. <laughs> Barney, Barney, are you yeah. racist? Like, what the fuck is this, Barney? Yeah, yeah. I just love that Harris has, suffers no no idiots, even if it's fucking Barney. Exactly. Like, I just love that. Like, and I love that there's a shot in this episode, and it's just like Harris making this face, <laughs> and it just like zooms in on it, and then it dissolves too. It's like zoom in and dissolves on him, just going because as only yeah. Ron, as only Ron, <laughs> as only Ron Glass can do too. So this was uh, probably as much as I enjoyed the first episode. I think I I enjoyed the jokes in the second and third episode more because again yeah. the jokes in this episode are pretty good too and, the, and that final joke is a standout the one thing i i teased earlier and we'll just talk about this real quick before we wrap is the idea of and it was a little confusing to me too as far as is his uh levitt now part of the bullpen or is he not part of the bullpen and it sounds like he's getting jerked around it sounds like one week on one week off kind of thing i don't think that's very fair to levitt uh, but if he keeps wearing those awful denim outfits, I'd keep him out of the bullpen completely. Oh, denim, Dan. Oof, man. Yikes. That Canadian was like, tuxedo. Dude. A Canadian would look at that and be like, oh, please. Yeah. <laughs> Good Lord. Yeah, that was that was a bit much. I think at the, what I would consider the Levitt character at this point is Mr. Plot Contrivance. Because it's like, well, he's in the he's down there and now he's back up here. Whatever, whatever the storyteller wants him yes. to do, that's where he's going to be. And that's what that allows it to do. It's like, well, we need you sometimes to fill in. And sometimes we don't. So it's like, okay, so if you want Levitt to fuck off this episode, just have him be, you know, not in plain clothes. If you want him to be around, he could be in plain clothes. Like, I get that. Like, that makes sense. Is it a cop out? Yes. 
But you know what? It's a plot cop out. So I don't know. It's fine. If there's any show to have a cop out, it should be Barney Miller. Fair. Sorry. That was awful. <laughs> Got him. That was awful. <laughs> that was a good one. Oh, Chris, on the next episode, we're continuing our journey into the depths of season six. We were talking about three episodes The Brother, The Slave, and Strip Joint. Sounds Ooh. very spicy. Mm. Mm, I'm yum, excited. Yum. <laughs> Until then, Chris, where can people find you and what you are up to? Weirdingwaymedia.com is where you can find the show that we kind of mentioned here, the Culture Cast. Uh, also, you can find eight, uh, 80s TV Ladies, which we also mentioned, uh, Dreams for Sale, uh, Twilight Zone 1985, which we also mentioned, all the things that I work on and the things that I work on with you, and I think everything that you work on as well is uh, all over at Weirdingwaymedia.com, where You're we're serving right. up audio you want to listen to. I don't break network. Oh, so I'm shit. not any sort of scab just jumping over to Wonderly or Earwolf or something. It's Oof. it's all about Weirding Way Media. Oh, man. I would ask you where people could find your work, but you just answered it. Yeah, right there. So if you want to hear more of me shooting off my mouth, come on over to WeirdingWayMedia.com. I do a show. Some people have heard of it called The Projection Booth. Talk about movies every single week. And sometimes more than once a week. This is one of those crazy times for me. By the time this airs, it'll all be in my rear view. Maybe I've regained a little bit of my sanity, but don't count on it. (laughs) I'm not regaining my sanity or counting on it. I want to thank John Walker for composing our theme song. I want to thank you for listening to this. If you get this over at iTunes, go on over and leave a rating or review. It really helps us out. Um, yeah, we're wokesters. We get it. It's 2023. And we're looking at a show from 1979. We talk politics sometimes, especially because Barney Miller talks politics. So you know, we he went. Uh, we're, we're talking about the inauguration of presidents and talking about strikes and all this kind of stuff. It's real, actual life out there, folks. So get used to it. And you know what they say: if you can't deal with the fact that the show's bringing it up, it's not really our fault. Perfect place to end it.